you're very welcome to the Critical Lowdown. Could you start by introducing yourself to our listeners, a bit about you, your background and DZS, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Kiara, and thanks for having me today. No uh, I'm Gunter no. Rice. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at DCS, and uh, I'm originally out of Austria. I started my career there. I then uh, spent 21 years in various places at Ericsson, at the mobile um, supplier and leader in that industry, and uh, in, uh, other than Austria and Sweden and uh, the Silicon Valley and Plano, Texas. And I spent a few years in, um, in the UK. I came back and um, then I joined a company called A10 Networks in Cybersecurity and 5G and um, yeah, spent a, f- uh, a year with a number of startups. And I joined DCS just in February of this year. DCS is, uh, I get really excited about joining DCS because our, uh, you know, the, the CEO is iconic in our industry, Charlie Boak. Charlie Bose, yeah. uh, the management team is fantastic. And um, yeah, I was intrigued by the opportunity to really make a difference in fiber broadband and, uh, and um, open run and the optical infrastructure and software solutions. And uh, today, DCS is one of the leaders in uh, access networking, optical infrastructure, and cloud software solutions. Uh, the company has more than 700 service providers around the world as customers. We are connecting more than tens of millions of households. We are, rough, we are a public company on the stock market. And um, yeah, we are capitalizing on the, on the super cycle of investments in fiber broadband and 5G. Amazing. That's a really good intro. Thanks for that, Gunter. Um, I'd like to start with a high level question, if that's OK. Uh, sure. What's your perspective excuse me, on the future of fiber broadband connectivity and the current state of deployments in the major global markets like North America, EMEA and Asia? Well, just that, like I mentioned earlier, um, and that's one of the reasons why I joined DCS, uh, the the future of uh, fiber broadband connectivity really has never been more exciting and brighter. And um, what are some of the reasons for it? Uh, some one of one of the reasons, and actually, what I want to highlight is too that you can actually call broadband connectivity to today the force utility after water, gas, and electricity. And some possibly would rank it actually the second most valuable or important after yeah, after electricity, absolutely. right? I mean, it yeah. is. We, yeah. we can't live anymore without broadband connectivity. Now, the other two, uh, I would call catalysts or tailwinds. One is the emergence of the metaverse the augmented reality, virtual reality applications. You have low latency multiplayer gaming consoles and and really bandwidth hungry, even HD type of video conferencing and low latency applications. So they really demand higher bandwidth, um, better broadband internet. And the second aspect is really that governments are now spending around the world more than $120 billion to, to connect everybody uh, and, and all the households. And so in the US, we have here the BEAD program, which is from the government, $42 billion. We have the Middle Mile program, $1 billion. We have the Capital Projects Fund, another $10 billion. And just to give you a perspective, in the US, we have r- roughly 60 million homes connected today. And that's just with, with fiber. And that's just 43%. And then from a European perspective, if you look at it, you have um, the UK, less than 10% today is connected to fiber. And um, that's why the government uh, announced the gigabit project to connect mm-hmm. by 2030, 100% of, uh, of, of homes. And the same happened actually in Germany. Think about it. Germany today, fourth largest economy in the world, has not more than 5 6% of households connected with fiber. And yeah. so that's where actually last month, the Minister of Digital called it the digital awakening, which I thought was really interesting. And so he committed that by 2030, 100% of households in Germany will be connected uh, to fiber optic. You have the same uh, issue in Italy. You have the same issue in France. 
same issue in, in Austria, actually, where I'm originally from. And all those governments are basically investing heavily in addition to, to the private equity companies. Mm -hmm. Because in Germany, private equity companies spent 30 billion top billion dollars on top of it and Deutsche Telekom and Deutsche Glasfaser and so on. Mm -hmm. They invest heavily in fiber optic infrastructure. And just to round it up is there are countries today like Korea, like Sweden, like Spain, which actually have 80% fiber optic coverage today to the households. And mm -hmm. to me, that is a massive um, uh, you know, uh, advantage for them to, uh, to really drive digital and digital service and a digital economy. And this is an economic advantage for these countries. And they keep upgrading to get to basically provide, obviously, new services and more broadband connectivity to the households. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. And I think you will see this super cycle, what we call super cycle, mm -hmm. go on for the next decade. Yes, yeah, certainly. We we can see that too. And you're talking about the, the targets by these governments by 2030. Um, and we've participated in some of the Gigabit Britain um, business summits over in the UK. So, yeah, I, I understand all of that. Um, but, you know, it, what do you see as a driving force behind more and more service providers transforming into experience providers? Yes, they they need to provide this um coverage and broadband connectivity but it's more around experience and uh, enclosing the word experience here in air quotes uh, which I know won't tra translate on a, a podcast but I think everybody is recognizing the demand on service providers to provide the the full seamless experience to keep their customers happy so what's driving this uh, move towards uh, experience providers well, I'm excited we are so aligned about this transformation from today's service providers into the experience provider. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, let, let's think about what is it all about for us in the home where we have all these new applications where we connect maybe up to 10 or 20 devices now. We even think about, you know, beyond the metaverse, 8K televisions and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it is about us, uh, home users, that a service provider delivers us the ultimate, what I call the ultimate subscriber experience. And I think over the last years, we saw the, the big hyperscalers, the Amazons, the Googles, and so on. They're stealing the thunder of providing their services. And then the service provider became just the bit pipe still, just the broadband connectivity provider. But uh, you know, as an experience provider, the, the service providers have really an opportunity uh, to to be of more value to to us mm -hmm. as as home users, and so there there is a, the power is literally shifting for some of these you know service providers becoming experience provider to to them by uh, and as well to us as subscribers because we as subscribers think about that. Um, I give you an example. Some of our recent studies says seventy percent of all Wi-Fi connectivity uh, of all connectivity issues, broadband connectivity issues are attributed to Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So, and that goes down to the broadband provider. And so wouldn't it be nice as we as subscribers have an application on our phone and we can actually auto discover all our connected devices from ring bells to, uh, to the 8K televisions, to the gaming mm -hmm. consoles, and we can actually identify right away where are the issues. We can actually identify where we need lower latency because it's a gaming competition and where we don't. And so, um, and that will help because so that will help the service provider also to reduce, you know, the track rolls to get people sent out to try to figure out what's going on, which can be expensive, reduce churn and so on. And, uh, and so on the other hand, as a service provider, what you really want is you want an, a, a multi-vendor, again, vendor agnostic kind of end-to-end -end service assurance and Wi-Fi experience management. You want visibility into your network from your OLT, your ONT, your Wi-Fi access point, all the way to your device. And mm -hmm. so to really deliver that ultimate uh, ultimate quality of experience. And um, so that is the holy grail. And on top of it, it's not just remedy for issues, 
What you want a service provider is obviously a single pane of glass to see that all, uh, but you also want to be able to, through AI and through user behavior analytics and intelligence in the network, you want to take that data and then, which is really, I call it the gold, the gold for the service provider, and then have the marketing organization analyze it and say, oh, I can actually provide now new services to my subscribers. And suddenly there is a, there is a benefit, a real yeah. benefit for the service provider being an experience provider and for the subscriber benefiting because you you get the ultimate sub subscriber experience. Yeah, I, I can see that, um, you know, you're, you're placing the power in the hands of the, the service provider who is now the experience provider who is then enabling their subscribers to actually remedy those network issues almost, you know, a, a simplified app, let's say, you know, I, I need more bandwidth here, um, which is going to keep them happy. And then I would also imagine that, you know, creating these in-home experiences, um, you know, provides these opportunities. You're, you're talking about, you know, the marketing people can come up with new services that are going to please the end user, which is also good, then going to generate incremental revenues for the service provider. And obviously more revenue is, you know, good uh, from a from a business point of view. Um, OK, and, you know, I, I had a question and this one is for our engineer and CTO uh, type listeners out there. Um, you know, what does it take for a service provider to deliver this type of experience? Um, where maybe it's immersive, it's working well, and you know, what are the technical requirements? So, so the technical requirements for an immersive uh, in-home experience is, um, well, for me, really a total immersive experience is the metaverse, the Decentraland, uh, the uh, sandbox, the kind of where you have augmented reality, virtual reality, digital reality, and and the physical reality all synced up into one reality. And this is obviously, we are right at the beginning, at the forefront of, oh, and over the next decade, that will obviously really become a reality, if you want to call it this way. And research suggests right now that to provide that ultimate metaverse immersive experience, it will take three to five gigabit of bandwidth or throughput and it will require a latency of five to twenty milliseconds mm -hmm. to uh, to provide that. And um, I think one of the aspects which I want to highlight here too is that it is not only about throughput and about the latency. It is also about, for example, a picture quality when you when you obviously want when you want to transmit that. And so uh, let's let's take an example: a holographic three D call at home so you would require you would look at okay what's the picture quality if you if you take an example of 10,000 points with 30 frames per second 100,000 points uh, again same fr frames per second or a million points frames per second just to you know get this picture granularity the difference is in bandwidth between in you know from the smaller size obviously five meg megabits per second all the way to 100 150 megabits per second and it also impacts the latency and uh which which can vary from 12 milliseconds to 35 milliseconds so that that is really critical that we have that infrastructure in place to support the bandwidth, the latency, but also then the quality of of obviously the pixels. And um, there is one more aspect, which you know how, the way how you could could summarize it. You need a symmetric capacity. You need um, a low latency but almost guaranteed low latency, because if latency varies too much, it also has an impact again on your experience. And then the third one is called, uh, what we call also concurrency. And there you want, you want you need an, a broadband access infrastructure, which is non-blocking and allows every single device to have access uh, to, uh, to, to the resources. And so, you know, this is, uh, this is a big order, and um, as I as I mentioned before, even when you sync right now, what I highlighted, 
that a lot of the governments and so on are investing right now in this infrastructure, um, we will we will have to continue to upgrade infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That that's for sure. Um, <laughs> there was this program on uh, the the TV in the eighties and nineties in Ireland called Tomorrow's World, and when you talk about you know holographic phone calls in your in your lounge or in your sitting room, it's just reminding me of episodes of uh, <laughs> of that program. Um, um, you you mentioned there the government funded programs um, that are happening across EMEA. They're happening in the US. Um, you know, Gigabit Britain in the UK and the Grey Spots Initiative in Germany and the Rip and Replace or the the um the various programs that are going on in the US. So are mm -hmm. the government funded programs, are they providing the needed guidance and legislation to adequately support um providing these Im immersive in-home experiences? Great question, Chiara. Um so um the, I'll give you a few examples. The U.S. Capital Projects Fund from the Treasury Department mandates today a minimum of 100 megabit downlink and 100 megabit up, uplink, totally symmetrical speed, a minimum latency. Um, but as I mentioned before, if you then want to really, uh, you know, be able to consume some of these latest AR, VR applications, as well as the the metaverse type of applications where we talk about multiple gigabits, um, that's not that's not sufficient. And I think, you know, what I haven't probably highlighted earlier is too that in a household where you have maybe nowadays where people work from home as well, you have multiple you know video conferences going on. You have uh, maybe kids playing at the same time, maybe later on in the afternoon after school already on a gaming console. And uh, you have multiple other connected devices. That's where you suddenly run into trouble, and um, that creates a problem. The you know another example I give you is, and that's even worse, is the Beat program, F fantastic program. As I said, forty-two billion dollars, massive, mm -hmm. to really connect the underserved and unserved also um, across the United States. But here, the requirements are just 100 megabit downlink and 20 megabits upstream. Mm -hmm. And so to, from my perspective, that is, um, that is helpful because, you know, a lot of these rural areas today don't have any connectivity. So it, 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 is, it is obviously uh, a step in the right direction, but it, it unfortunately provides a continued inequality. And uh, if I then, uh, you know, look at uh, Europe and uh, Europe today, the European Union committed that they want to provide connectivity for all households in Europe by 2025, which I think is aggressive, of at least 100 megabit per second. And that could be still copper or, or fiber. Um, and then uh, one gigabit to at least to airports and to schools and to various other uh, hospitals and so on. So that's that's on their agenda. But just to, again, um, give you another glimpse of, for example, in Africa, Africa has today just eight, an average of eight megabit per second of connectivity. So there is a lot of, obviously, um, you know, a lot of work to do to bring them to levels even to 100 meg. The, the average speed in in, uh, in in European municipalities is today 64 meg. So uh, there is there's a lot of work yeah, and a lot of opportunity. Yeah, a lot of opportunity too. I mean, we're working a lot in in Africa on greenfield deployments where you know it's wide expanses of, of rural areas, and we're trying to connect them, and we're trying to provide that um that level of connectivity, and you know. Uh, we've one customer where we're providing to, uh, 200 gig um links but you know that the opportunity is there and the need is there um but if i'm if i'm to change direction just ever so slightly um i was going to ask why is end to end multi vendor you mentioned multi vendor earlier um network orchestration and maintaining service uptime so important for a service provider's network operations yeah. So, and and particularly as as you said, there there are a lot of um, providers or suppliers today out there who provide proprietary end-to-end uh, -end network orchestration and uh, and service assurance and automation capabilities. Um, you know, 
I mean, companies like Nokia and my former company, Ericsson, and there are many, many more. And um, it works for their infrastructure. But I think what really the the operations team, the network operations teams are excited about now is, uh, you know, a vendor agnostic end-to-end network orchestration and automation software tool that really offers them a single pane of glass for an easy provisioning and an overall service assurance. Because, you know, they have to integrate new network elements all the time and you and from different vendors. And so you want to be able to do that in a, in a very, what, what we call also low co- code, almost no code kind of environment. So it's a, it's a really cool UI, UI and, um, and it needs to be simple. And you want to leverage also. So you want to do things what you have done in the past, which took like weeks. Uh, you want to be able to do that in uh, not just even days, in hours, in, in, yeah. in minutes. And uh, you want to leverage AI and, and, and analytics tools to really automate a fully programmable uh, network infrastructure. And uh, why, why do you want that? You, you, the, the result ultimately is that you reduce your operational, your OPEX mm-hmm. costs, and, uh, and you simplify some of the processes, which are today still t- t- tedious and, uh, and complex. And uh, so that's why, uh, you know, we particularly at DCS are excited about these developments uh, of, of our network orchestration software tool. And um, you can go actually a step further because network orchestration and automation, partic- I'm, you know, from my perspective, I always think about network slicing in the 5G world. And um, and there, why do you why do you apply network slicing? Because you have different use cases. You have, for example, you, you know, for an autonomous driven car, you need low latency. For a smart parking meter, you need more reliability and security. So you can provide different, I call them channels, for with, with these guarant, guaranteed uh, ingredients or elements. Now think about that we have now been able to develop that same capability, not just for the mobile infrastructure, but also what you will see is for the broadband access infrastructure and for optical. So really, really cool. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the network orchestration or this single pane of glass, as you put it, that's what actually is reducing the truck rolls because it's a, you know, the, it, you're putting out your new services across the network from that single point, but also actually getting those services out faster in, in a matter of hours is pleasing the sir that's pleasing the end users the subscribers and then you're going to increase your customer loyalty as a result so um it's kind of it's a win-win there um okay so you know we all know that the lines between residential and commercial subscribers have kind of blurred a bit since the pandemic because now people are actually working from home um, and what matters to subscribers of any kind you know residential or commercial it's just that the internet works when they need it to uh, we've right. all experienced you know the frustration of not being able to see or hear the other participants in a zoom call or you know these awkward delays on the line um, which are which are not helpful in business meetings and um, so when, when issues like this consistently occur subscribers are going to naturally look for alternative broadband providers and um, so how can isps deliver the highest quality of experience to the residential subscribers to avoid these issues and to avoid a flood of complaints and and, and losing their customers customer churn and can they use a lot utilize this user behavior analytics that you mentioned earlier to allow them to offer a better quality of experience yeah no i, I mean you you captured that really well that is the situation what unfortunately a lot of the the households experience today and uh i was literally on a on a, on a uh, you know Zoom call uh, just last week uh, with somebody at college in in, in London, and uh, and he froze all the time. Poor guy mm-hmm. had to apologize all the time. So, but that shows that you know the subscriber quality of experience uh, is 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 fundamental because if you can't provide that, then uh, you unfortunately set yourself up with churn. And people will switch and there is much more competition now out there than ever to provide these services. But it's not so so subscriber quality of experience is really everything. 
but it uh, but it really dif it differs. It significantly differs at the time of the day and uh, what some of some of the user preferences are. And so this is an opportunity for the service providers to timely uh, provide services with the relevant quality of experience by using some of the AI and analytics capabilities to monitor the user behavior and then manage the quality of experience based on the usage patterns. And so a good example, and you might be familiar with the Google Nest. I have one of one of them where uh, it, it's very clever because it understands what weather is there, what are the user behaviors, uh, what kind of temperature do we like in our household, and then it keeps learning and learning, and then it basically just provides, you know, adjusts and adopts to the temperature what the user wants, and uh, at more or less any moment in time. Uh, independently. And that is something what service providers can now with the latest technology can do as well. They can actually, through the, the user behavior analytics, can learn what uh, what's going on in those households. And for instance, if, um, if there is somebody in the household playing at, at a certain, let's say in the afternoon from, uh, you know, 4 to 5 p.m., uh, there's somebody playing uh, a, a, on, on a gaming console. And mm -hmm. for that reason, that specific user will need much lower latency to provide the ultimate quality of experience. And mm -hmm. so service providers can actually adjust that. And as I said before, in the, in, in, in the world, what we are now looking at, we can actually uh, you know, envision that you just have your, your application on, let's say, an iPhone or a Samsung phone and you can actually manipulate that uh, what what latency or service you need. So we are we are really quite advanced now, and um, I'm I'm just excited about what's in front of us over the next two to three years in evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would love <laughs> to have access to that at my fingertips <laughs> to say I'm about to go on an important Zoom work call. My husband is on Microsoft Teams and my kids are trying to, you know, stream Lightyear on Disney Plus because it's just out. Um, yeah, I, if I could manipulate <laughs> so that I uh, that I'm insured, you know, the highest quality of service, then uh, that would certainly be beneficial. Um, OK, Gunter, so uh, this has been lovely chatting with you, Ben. I just have a kind of a crystal ball type question to ask you to finish yeah. up. Um, so what do you see as the biggest imperative or opportunity for service providers over the next you know, two to five years? Well, great, great question. I, um, I, I see myself or at least over the last 25 years at the opportunity to, um, you know, to always look forward envision what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years. And uh, that's why I'm so excited about, you know, this particular industry we are in. I call it a once in a generation opportunity for service providers. Um, you know, the fixed service providers that don't jump on the bandwagon uh, of implementing these next generation broadband technologies from GPON, XGS, PON, 25 gig, what we are talking now, 50 gig, which will come over the next years out there and even you know all the way to 100 gig pond. Um, and when you complement that with some of the, what I mentioned earlier, vendor agnostic, end-to-end -end network orchestration, automation, service assurance, Wi-Fi experience management to basically ultimately deliver the uh, subscriber experience and an immersive experience, the service providers which don't do that will be left behind. And so it's very it's very simple. So that's why we are so adamant to help these service providers in their transformation to experience providers. And and DCS is really at the forefront of of deploying the services, partnering up with you know fifteen of the top thirty so service providers in the world are our customers today. And we have customers in you know in rural America in the tier twos, tier threes. Um, you know, Korea, Japan, um, you know, across the globe. So we are very, very fortunate, but we are very, very dedicated to support our service providers in their transformation. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, we are, we are today connecting and providing these experiences to tens of millions of households and, um, 
and 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 their subscribers. Uh, we're helping them with reducing the truck rolls, which I mentioned also, three hundred fifty to four hundred dollars, maybe a pop. Um, customer support calls are are reduced by thirty five percent. We're helping them increasing the net promoter scores, and um, I think, and I alluded to earlier. What is really important for service providers is not just to try to drive cost reductions and drive more efficiency, but give them an opportunity to upsell and provide more services to us as home sub subscribers. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it goes all the way from cybersecurity to parental control to provide, you know, new low latency capabilities that gamers and they want to invest. Believe me, they are today, the gamers are at the forefront of this broadband infrastructure as well, because they need such low latency to gain a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And um, and so they pay for it. So from that perspective, I am just excited. I'm thrilled about this once in a generation opportunity to be a, a, a member of the, the DCS team and um, and I'm also excited that we work together as uh, DCS and EPS Global and to to literally transform together the, the service providers to become uh, these experience providers. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've uh, summed it up really nicely there in a nutshell. So we can help enable these uh, service providers to become experience providers that will bring about happy, loyal customers, which at the end of the day is, is the most important thing. Um, so thank you for joining us today, Gunther. It was really a pleasure speaking to you and um, we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, Chiara. It was my pleasure. Talk to you soon.